Uh, it was a few years ago when my sons were still in Little League when I first was introduced to the phrase targeted advertising. I was with my boys watching a game, and we were with another couple, and we had had the same bag chair to sit at at this Little League game, and it was falling apart. It was rusting, Uh, and and I said to my wife, we need a new chair. We're at these games all day, and we go to these tournaments, and you're sitting in these chairs all day. I said, I'd like like to get a new chair. And so as I'm there, I'm, 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 I'm scouting out all the chairs that the fancy parents have, okay? And I see one fancy parent with this wonderful bag chair that as you sit in it, it actually rocked. And I said, ooh, ooh, that's the chair I like. I want that chair. So I go up to this this, this couple. I didn't even know who they were. (laughs) They must have thought I was strange. I said, I like that chair. Can I test it out? And they let me test it out, and I said, this chair is great. Where do I get it? And they start looking on their phone of places where they got it from. And I left that day, and I forgot. And then you know what happens, and this creeps us all out when it happens, right? Later on that day, I'm searching on my phone on Amazon, or I was on Instagram or something like this, and what do I get an ad for? That exact chair. And I don't know how it happens. I don't know if it's voodoo or what or whatever, okay? But the targeted advertising got me. Why? Because we live in a world that is consumed by you and I consuming. We are consuming of things and objects and oftentimes entertainment. And many of us live then by that mindset that I am what I have. Now, let me just tell you, I did not gain any great confidence in having this rocking chair. My identity is not found in it, but let me tell you, If you're sitting at a game, you want to hang near me because I got the best chair now, okay? I got the best chair. I found it on sale at Dick's Sporting Goods the next day. It was great. It was great. But when we live in a consumer type of mindset, when we allow consuming things and people and places and objects are there for me to have, for me to obtain, we start to believe the lie, I am what I have. It's different if you have a distributor mindset, however. If you see your life not just as one to take, but one to give, you say that I am not what I have, but I know who I am so I can give. Do you see a difference? The consumer says, I will get my next fix on that next item I can purchase. And, you know, I guess I give off the middle-aged dad vibes. You know, that chair was like the best thing I had purchased in a long time, okay? I'm sure there's a lot more exciting things, but... But I'll get my fix by that next item I could purchase, by the next experience I could have, by that next vacation I could go on, or I'll gain my my, my fix on that next person that will fulfill this area of need I think I have in my life. This next relationship will be able to quench some desire I have in my life, whereas if we live with a distributor mindset... We're thinking, I I gain meaning not by what I could garner, but by what I can distribute and give, who I can serve, whose need I can meet. You see, one mindset, the the, the consumer mindset, it, it leads to an endless cycle of searching for the next dopamine high. And you know what happened to me? I'm sitting in my nice chair, rocking back and forth at the game. And I realized this other family had a better cooler than I had. (laughs) And theirs was on wheels. And if you've been a part of this baseball scene on the island, you know the way this goes. There's always that family with the setup. And I said to my wife, we need a cooler like that. (laughs) Because it's never enough. Are you with me this morning? It's never enough. I need that next dopamine high. Whereas if we live with this distributor mindset, We can have a steady peace. I I bought a new set of golf clubs. It was the first time I had ever bought new golf clubs. I figured these these would make me a good golfer, which still has not happened. But I'd always just use hand-me-downs and and, and used ones. And and my wife said, we're going to get you some nice ones for your 40th. And I bought nice golf clubs, okay? I had saved up, and we went it, and we bought it, and and guess what happened? Six months later, the newest golf clubs were now the second newest golf clubs, and I could have got them for like $200 cheaper (laughs) because it was never enough. And this morning, I have good news for you. In fact, this is what the word gospel means, right? Good news. The word gospel is good news. 
I have good news for you this morning. That if you know Jesus, the Spirit of God in our life frees us from this bondage to always having and needing more for yourself and enables us to live on mission for him as a distributor of his goodness, his grace, his mercy. That you no longer need to find identity, worth, satisfaction by the things and the experiences and the people that you are able to accumulate in your corner for your selfish needs. No, rather, God says the spirit within you wants to give you gifts so that you can be a gift to others. See, the spirit's role is integral in our life in freeing us from a consumer bondage to a distributor mindset. This fall, we've been talking about the Holy Spirit each and every week. The Holy Spirit. Remember, the Christian belief in God is called the Trinity, that each person is fully God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and there is one God. One plus one plus one for Christian theology equals... One, very good theologians with your math. You will not pass your SATs if you do that, okay? But it's a reminder of this divine mystery. And isn't it it beautiful to know that we worship a God that we cannot completely understand and fit into a box of our articulation, that with our limited mindsets and abilities, we're able to understand the divine like this. It should make us humble. Are you with me today? And this fall, we've been talking about the Holy Spirit. How we might, through trust in Jesus, experience his presence and his power. The the, the Holy Spirit, the, the personal, divine presence of God that Jesus, when he was with his last disciples, said, receive the Spirit. Remember? The very ruach, the very breath, wind of God, the pneuma of God, the very presence of God. May you receive it in your life. We, we, we've been talking how the Spirit of God, of God uh, 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 reminds us or, 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 or reveals to us our sin and our shortcoming and how we can be born again by the Spirit, John chapter 3. And how when the Spirit then lives within us, when we are born again by the very Spirit of God in our hearts, that we are baptized into a new family, that we are sealed unto the day of redemption. That the Holy Spirit is a first fruits in our life, promising us that there is more good from God to come in our life. How the Spirit of God is a down payment that we know one day God will make all things new as he has made my life new. And the Christian journey then is putting to death the deeds of the flesh and saying, Lord, how might I walk in your spirit? How might I be more filled, controlled by the Spirit of God in my life that you have made possible as a gift? And last week, we talked about the role that the Spirit plays in our life when we are praying towards him, when we do not know what we need, but yet in groanings inexpressible, the Spirit of God lets the Father above, through Jesus himself, know what we exactly need. Isn't it good? That God knows exactly what we need when we don't even know what we need. (laughs) And this morning, we see that the Spirit of God, as we walk with him, as we groan with our needs and desires before him, that the Spirit of God says, I have good for you. I have gifts I want to give you. I have enablements that I want you to be bestowed with in order that you might be a person who as well loves and serves just as God has loved and served us. And if you're a follower of Jesus here today, the Spirit of God within you has given you a gift or multiple gifts that he wants you to use to bless others, to not just consume but to distribute the very gifts and grace of God. And so this morning, we're going to look at an important text of Scripture, one of several in the New Testament that talk about spiritual gifts and the great opportunity they give for all of us to grow in our faith. This morning, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 7. 1 Corinthians, it's in your New Testament, a, a few books into it. The book of 1 Corinthians, written by the Apostle Paul, to a church in Corinth that was amazingly gifted and yet struggling with living out their faith in a 
secular, pagan city and world. Can we identify with Corinth? But we're going to see this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 7, are two baseline, foundational, simple, really, truths. Not simplistic, hear me now. Simple, basic truths and one command. That if we really say we believe what the scriptures are teaching, then we need to obey. So let's look into God's word together. You'll see the words on the screen as well as in your Bibles. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 12 beginning in verse 1. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be unaware I know that when you were pagans, you used to be enticed and led astray by mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus is cursed, and no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except by the who? Holy Spirit. Now, there are different gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different ministries, but the same Lord, and there are different activities, but the same God produces each gift in each person. A manifestation of the Spirit is given to each person for the common good. This is the word of the Lord. Amen? Two truths and one command this morning. The first truth is simply stated in those first three verses, and here it is, Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Look again with me in the first three verses. He's saying that we are going to talk about spiritual gifts. We're going to talk about those divine enablements, those divine manifestations of the work of God in our life. And he says this, that before you knew Jesus and you lived in your pagan way of life, you might have been tempted as you worshipped those mute idols. You got to like Paul, these little like side jabs, you know. Like, he doesn't, like, come out and, like, say, you know, you, you tried your best to worship. You know, he's saying, listen, those idols on the stage over there, they're mute. They don't talk, you know. It's like you got to like those guys that know how to give a subtle jab here, okay. Here's Paul. He's saying, you know, those, those mute idols, you know, you know. It's like, it's like my Mets fans this morning when they saw me and they walked in and they said, hey, Pastor, did you have a good night last night? And I said, no, no. no okay, that's what Paul's doing here. I'm not going to call anybody out by name, Glenn, on that. I'm not going to call anybody out on that, okay. Here's Paul doing it, but spiritually. He's saying, when you used to worship those mute idols that gave you nothing, you might have said Jesus is cursed. But to truly believe and profess and claim that Jesus is Lord, guess what, Paul says? That's a gift. The Spirit of God, verse 3. No one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is cursed. No, no one can say Jesus is Lord except what? By the Holy Spirit. Now you're saying to yourself, well, listen, I don't know God, but I could say the words, Jesus is Lord. He's not talking about just the articulation of words. He's saying a confession of one's life. That we cannot express and confess with our life that Jesus is truly Lord unless the Spirit of God does something in our life. We talked about it a few weeks ago. The Spirit of God causes us to be born again. As we look upon Jesus lifted up and trust in him. He says when we trust in and proclaim that Jesus is Lord, we have the options before us now. Will we continue to live that self-indulgent spirit kind of life? Or will we live with a submissive, servant-minded spirit? Do you see what he's saying here? When you confess that Jesus is Lord, you are submitting to Christ. You're saying, my life is not my own. You're saying, my purpose is not for myself alone. That my significance is not in what I accumulate for me and mine. When you proclaim Jesus is Lord, you are saying, Lord, you are the master. Jesus, you are the sovereign. God, my life is for your glory. 
My purposes are for your purposes. My marriage is to be a, a, a sign to the world of, of the sacrifice of Jesus. That, that how I love and instruct my kids is to be a reminder of the great sacrifice God calls us to give towards others. That how I manage the money in my hand and the resources you've entrusted to me is so that you might be glorified. So that you might be lifted up because Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. I mean, Romans 10, 9 says it. The basic confession. Confess with your mouth that Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be what? Saved. I mean, that's the good news of the gospel. If you're here this morning and you have never professed that, that that's a simple invitation to trust in Jesus. When you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, Lord, you are in charge. God, you are the sovereign. You are the Savior. I believe that God raised him from the dead, conquering sin, conquering death, offering forgiveness. The scriptures say you'll be saved. Philippians 2 talks about it as well, verse 11. It says that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess what? Jesus is Lord. So here, here, here's the idea with this phrase. You ready? We either confess Jesus is Lord now and begin to live in it now or get ready for the day when all will do it anyway. Are you with me this morning? Jesus invites us to not live a self-indulgent spirit life, but to live a submissive servant spirit life because Jesus is Lord. And listen, the church in Corinth need to hear this. They needed to hear it big time. You see in chapter 12, verse 25, and in chapter 14, verse 4, that this church that had amazing external gifts were so selfish. <laughs> they were using their gifts in order to pat themselves on the back. And God said, you've been gifted to serve. You see, they were in danger in Corinth of looking at spirituality as something just for themselves purpose, per, uh, and personally experiencing it on their own when Paul wants them to see that they are to worship God and to advance his kingdom. And so this morning, the question as we begin in this first point is this, is he your Lord? And if he is, what mute idols do you need to repent from? Now we hear that and we think, well, pastor, I am a, a, a 21st century modern American. There is nothing in my home that's an idol that I bow down and worship. But you know what the truth is? We are much more clever in the idols that we worship. I, I want to give you a few here. Tim Keller talks about it this way. That something is an idol in my life, think of these phrases, if we say verbally or, or, or in our heart, my life has meaning if, or I only have worth if, you fill in the dots, here are some that I give for you to think about. I am free from obligations and responsibilities, the independence idolatry. That I'm retired, I got enough saved, I don't need nobody. If our confidence is in our lack of obligations and responsibilities, it could be an idol in our life. For others of us, my life only has meaning if I am highly productive and getting a lot done. This is what we struggle with in New York. It's that work idolatry. That man, I get things done. I close the deal. I make things happen, and it becomes an idol. Or how about this one? I'm going to go from preaching to meddling. <laughs> that I only have worth, I only have confidence, I only have peace, I only have meaning if my political or social cause is making progress and ascending in influence or power. Big gulp. That in two weeks from now, I'll only have peace. If the candidate of my choice ascends to position, it could be an idol in our life. Or how about this one? That I am being recognized for my accomplishments, that I am excelling in my work, the idol of achievement. 
or I have a certain level of wealth, financial freedom, nice possessions. That's the idol of materialism. Or how about this one? That my life only has worth if I have a particular kind of look or body image. The image, idolatry. And the list could go on and on. Are you with me? And each and every one of us struggles with different ones, perhaps at different times and seasons in our life. And sometimes they overlap and intermingle. And we forget the simple, basic command that the church of God has been proclaiming for thousands of years. Do you remember it? Jesus is Lord. Very good. Thank you. Jesus is Lord. I want you to say it with me. Jesus is Lord. Lord, there is no more freeing phrase we can declare. Because watch what it does. It leads us to the second truth. We are gifted. Jesus is Lord. We are gifted. Look at verses 4 and 6 through 6 once again. Now there are different gifts, but same spirit. Different ministries, but same Lord. Different activities, but the same God produces each gift in some people, right? Each gift in what? Each person. Okay, everybody stand up, look up. No, don't stand up. Just look up. Look around you. I want you to point to somebody near you and say, you are gifted, Go ahead, go ahead, tell them. Encourage them today. You are gifted. You are gifted. That's right. Squeeze the cheek of your buddy over there. I see it. I see it. That's what I would have probably done, okay? What are we trying to communicate? What, what are the scriptures teaching us here? That yes, Jesus is Lord, and his lordship is not a demanding lordship that grabs from us what he can as servants that get beaten down. Because guess what? That's the way the lords of this world work. That's what materialism says. Beat you down until you get more and more, and when you die, guess what? The hearse does not attach to a U-Haul. You know the old story. Or, Lord, I, you know, I, I want to pursue a person, this person, this relationship, and when you realize in the end they have mistakes, they can never measure up. You see, we are freed by the Spirit of God when he is Lord to remind ourselves that we are gifted, and the gifting comes from God himself. Did you notice in the text, my Bible scholar students, he says, same Spirit, the same Lord, the same God gives gifts. What is he referencing? The Trinity itself. That God himself says, here's gifts. Here's what I want you to have. I want you to use these gifts to serve. Jesus is Lord, and we are gifted. It, it, later on here in verse 8 and following, we see some of these gifts that are explained. It says, through the one that's given a message of wisdom through the Spirit, to another knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another miracles, to another prophecy, to another the distinguishing of spirits, all different kinds of tongues and interpretations of tongues. What, what is Paul saying? That there are a diversity of gifts that I give to a diversity of people under the lordship of Jesus in order that you might serve. You are gifted. You are gifted for a particular time in a particular place to serve a particular group of people. A particular time and a particular place to serve a particular group of people. That the Spirit of God says for you to be free from the bondage of consuming and finding your identity in the things of this world, you need to look and discern who are the people, what is the place, and where and how can I serve them. You know, we live in a world that is so overly connected we know what's going on across the globe. 
And I'm a news junkie. I mean, man, I, 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 I'm like, from the moment I wake up through the day at the night, my phone's dinging and I'm following things and I, I love the news and reading up on things. I, I love learning of all these things. But you know what often happens? We know so much about what's going on all around us that we are paralyzed by our analysis of everything in the world and we're missing the opportunity right in front of us to use our gifts to serve others. Are you with me this morning? Who are the people and the place and the time that God has placed you right in front of you to serve? You have a gift. I think of it yesterday with our fall fest. I mean, in a wonderful day. Now, when we started this five years ago, it was right in the middle of COVID. We called it Trunk or Treat for those of you that were here. I know I was at a church once that did it. I said, well, it's COVID. We can't really be around each other. How do we do it? And Tammy Parada, for those of you that know Tammy Parada, she said, I will find trunks. I will find people. And all I did is get up on Sunday and say, bring candy. Now, if you remember those days, and I don't want to get too back into those days, but if you remember those days, you know, we had these masks on, and we're walking in here with bags of candy, okay? In fact, it's my favorite thing to tell people. When I first came to the church, I was here in February of 2020. I kept it open for four Sundays, and then I closed it, you know? Pastor Dan had kept it open 55 years. I kept it open four weeks, right? And then we came back from COVID, and so I was your televangelist pastor, if you remember those days, you know, you know, putting everything online, right? Then we came back from COVID, and remember, we had to wear the masks in the services, remember? I'll never forget, after several months or whenever it was when we stopped wearing masks, I was introducing myself to people, and people were saying, Pastor Mike, I've been at this church all year. I said, this is the first time I've seen your face, you know? So we're at that first trunk or treat, you know, in 2020, and we have masks on and gloves on, and we're handing out these things, and, and we had to pre-register people. I think we had, a, had 100 people at each time section spread out like crazy, all the things we were doing at that time. And just some people started to get a little heart for it. And so Tammy, with her great organization of skills, got that going. And the next year, they said, we, we want to we feed people, too. I said, come on now, you know, just, just give out the candy. That's enough, you know. So I don't know if you remember, we had little pizza boxes over here, like every Staten Island outreach has, you know, bagels and pizza boxes, you know. And, and we had pizza boxes, and we were giving out pizza. We ran out of pizza. And then we hired Pastor Ben Denny. And he's like, oh, no, we're going to do hay rides, and we're going to give out pumpkins, and we're going to do sensory room things. I said, that's I said, Ben, you crazy? I don't know if people are coming. And you remember two years ago, all of a sudden we got overwhelmed. They were like, oh. Okay, and then last year, someone, something placed on Courtney's heart to, to, to develop a sensory room for special needs kids. You remember this? Yesterday and throughout the weeks leading up to, to a, a moment like that of service, there were people that were getting in trucks and making runs to various BJs and, and, and Costco's to get supplies. And there were people organizing and designing uh, things to hand out. There were people that were bringing joy as they welcomed people to their trunks. There was people that were singing. There were, there were people that were leading the kids in activities, people that were riding the hay ride around. Thank God no kids were lost, okay, all these things. Underneath all of that, there were people that came behind it and said, I want to give financially to make this happen. Uh, I, we, want, we want to offer this for free. As long as I'm the pastor here, we want to offer these kinds of things in this community for free. But guess what? That means sacrificial giving based upon a, a conviction to tithe and to give back to the Lord what he has given to us. And guess what? We steward that to minister. That's as well a part of the gift. Someone asked me yesterday, Pastor Mike, you did an amazing job with this. I said, listen, my job is to show up and smile and shake hands because I don't have the gifts to pull off what we saw today. It's the other gifts. Are you with me? And this is what God says. We are all gifted. The rest of this chapter, read it. doesn't matter which gift you are. The body of Christ needs each other to use those gifts we're going to talk about them next week. Specific gifts. Four passages I want you to read over the next few weeks. 1 Corinthians 12 that we're here right now. Romans chapter 12. Ephesians chapter 4 and 1 Peter chapter 4. Read those sections of scripture. The four key passages in the New Testament that talk about spiritual gifts. Gifts that are up front. Gifts that are behind the scenes. Jesus is Lord, say it with me, Jesus is Lord, and once again, look to your buddy, you are gifted, and let me tell you, all right, all right no, no, no more pinching cheeks, everybody, all right, come on, we're almost done here, we need your gifts, you need my gifts, I need your gifts. 
as part of the body of Christ, the diversity of giftings God has given us. We need it in order so that we don't become a people and a church that just wants what we could take but desires to distribute and give. Are you with me? We need people that say, Pastor Mike, I don't know what my gifts are. I'm just starting out. You know what? We need somebody that says, I'm going to pick up bagels on Sunday mornings. You want to, be a, you want to use your gift? I'll, I will get praised by the, by the bagel team if I get some more volunteers, okay? Okay? I, 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 Pastor Mike, I don't know my gift, but I, I could hold a baby for an hour. Test what you, Pastor Ben's been looking for you. <laughs> And I don't know my gift, but, but Pastor Mike, I, I, God's given me the ability to sing. Guess what? Uh, come on out. Andrew will love it. I, I don't know what it gets, but I, I'm very good at organizing things. Oh, Pastor, I don't know, but God has blessed me material, and I, and I want to be able to give back. And, that God has given you the gift of, of, of giving in a special way. Lean into, use those gifts. We're going to talk about it more next week. So, Jesus is Lord. We are gifted. Amen. And lastly, so let's do good. Here's the command from Scripture. The two basic truths, simple truths. Jesus is Lord. We are gifted. So let's do good. He says it in verse 7. A manifestation of the Spirit is given to each person for their own self-aggrandizement. Is that what he says? For their church to get a pat on the back in the local news alone. Is that what it says? No, for the what? Common good. Under the lordship of Jesus being given gifts by the Spirit of God, we are to use them in our lives for good. Ben talked about in an announcement. You were a part of yesterday. You were part of doing something good. He says that we have a unity in our purpose, a diverse grouping of gifts to serve others. This is how we free ourselves from the consumer mindset to being a distributor. See, everyone receives a spiritual gift. It's an ability that comes to you freely. It's a gift for the purpose of ministering to the needs of others, to build up a community, a Christian community, and to serve in the world. The bottom line is every Christian in ministry has been given a gift by God. Everyone is a distributor. And look at the benefits. We have a family of God together, a community of God together. I love my family. I I love my wife, my kids. I love my my parents, my my, my siblings, my nephews, everybody in my life, my my nieces. We have a great nuclear, wonderful family, uh, uh, right? But, but, But let me tell you, as much as I love them and being around them, my wife and I still, when we drive onto this campus, guess what? We just feel like joy. Because I get to see Sean in church at 930 sitting in that spot like he has for years. I know that's where he's at. And when I see his smile and encouragement, I know that's, that's my brother in the Lord. We're part of the family of God. Are you with me this morning? I, I, I get to see Glenn and Glenn and pray for them for their, for their affiliations to the Jets and Mets. But you know what? It reminds me <laughs> that we're in this together. I get to see Andrew lead in worship and use his gifts to lead us before God's throne. I get to get a hug from Ben, and the man loves to hug everybody. I'm kind of, I'm not a, I don't like hugging. I'm not a big hugger, but you know, you know what? Once in a while, I'll give him a shug, you know? Why? Because he has joy in serving these kids in our youth. I love serving with our deacons who I know are praying for me. Are you with me? Our welcome team, who is the most joyful group of people on the earth. Why? Because we're part of something together for the good. Do you feel that? For eternity, for eternity. I, I think back of a, of a woman who, who, who used the gift God gave her, the simple gifts God gave her and how it impacted me so much. As a student in Chicago, I used to go to an inner city church. I've told you about it. Uh, Montclair Baptist Church, small little church. And every Sunday I would go there and, and I would spend all day at this church, this small church. And, and, and one of the women in the church, her name was Mrs. Wilson, okay? It's like basic, okay? But Mrs. Wilson. Every Sunday, almost every Sunday, after church, she invited me over to her house with her family. And she would make fun of the fact that I like New York pizza, you know. And she would buy all different Chicago-style pizzas and, and, and give me Chicago-style hot dogs and Chicago-style Italian beef. If you ever lived in Chicago like I have, you know what these things are about. And she would feed me all afternoon and encourage me. And say to me as a 19-year-old, 20-year-old, young pup in Bible school, God's going to use you. 
God's going to use you. Uh, Mrs. Wilson passed away, uh, 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 oh gosh, less than a year from now, uh, ago, and her daughter and family was still connected, r- reached out to me to, to send a video thanking her. And I, I sent the video and, and, and I sent it into her. And what they had done is all of the young people, all of the students that she had had an impact on for decades and decades, they put together this, this, this video tribute, thanking her. And all Mrs. Wilson did was feed this young little chubby Italian kid pizza on Sundays for three years, two and a half, three years, and said, God's going to use you. That's all she ever said. God's going to use you. Jesus is Lord, and we are gifted for a common good, and nobody's gift is greater than others. But when we steward them well, guess what? God accomplishes great things. Your life has meaning. Use your gift. Use your gift. Use your gift. Jesus is Lord. He wants you to be free from taking, 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 and to be a distributor. Why? Because we all would like a reel of videos like that at our funeral, wouldn't we? Well, the people that we've impacted for eternity. No matter how big and small God has a gift for you, will you use it? In, in 2005, a, a, a pediatrician, a doctor, his name was David Sirkaira. He, he shared a story of how a dying young girl showed his church the honor of serving God. It's called Sarah's Vase. I want you to hear this story. One Sunday, my wife had prepared a lesson on being useful. She taught the children that everyone can be useful, that usefulness is serving God, and that doing so is worthy of honor. The kids quietly soaked up my wife's words, and as the lesson ended, there was a short moment of silence. A little girl named Sarah spoke up. Teacher, she said, what can I do? I don't know how to do many useful things. Not anticipating uh, this kind of response, my wife quickly looked around and spotted an empty flower vase on the windowsill. Sarah, you could bring in a flower and put it in that vase. That would be a useful thing. Sarah frowned, but that's not important. It is, my wife replied, if you are serving somebody. Sure enough, the next Sunday, Sarah brought in a dandelion and placed it in the vase. In fact, she continued to do so each week. Without reminders or help, she made sure the vase was filled with a bright yellow flower Sunday after Sunday. When my wife told my pastor about Sarah's faithfulness, he placed the vase upstairs in the main sanctuary right next to the pulpit. That Sunday, he gave a sermon on the honor of serving others using Sarah's vase as an example. And the congregation was touched by the message, and the week started on a good note. But during that same week, this pediatrician said, I I got a call from Sarah's mother. She worried that Sarah seemed to have lost energy, and more than usual, she was not having an appetite. Offering her some reassurances, I made room in my schedule to see Sarah. After Sarah had a battery of tests and days of of examinations, I, I sat numbly in my office with Sarah's paperwork on my lap. When the results were tragic, tragic, she had leukemia. On the way home, I stopped to see Sarah's parents so that I could personally give them the terrible news. The genetics and the leukemia that was attacking her small body were a horrible mix. Sitting at their kitchen table, I did my best to explain to Sarah's parents that nothing could be done to save her life. I don't think I've had a more difficult conversation than the one I had that night. As time pressed on, Sarah became confined to bed and to the visits that many people gave her. She lost her smile, she lost most of her weight, and then it came, another telephone call. Sarah's mom asked me to come and see her, and I dropped everything and ran to the house, and there she was, a small bundle that barely moved. And after a short exam, I knew that Sarah would be leaving the world very soon. I told her parents, spend as much time with her as possible. That was a Friday afternoon, the doctor said. On Sunday morning, church started as usual. The singing, the sermon. It all seemed meaningless when I thought of Sarah. I felt enveloped in sadness. And at the end of the sermon, the pastor suddenly stopped speaking. His eyes wide, he stared at the back of the church with utter amazement. And everyone turned to see what he was looking at. It was Sarah. Her parents had brought her for one last visit, bundled in a blanket, 
holding a dandelion in one little hand. She didn't sit in the back row, the doctor said. Instead, she slowly walked to the front of the church where her vase was still perched by the pulpit. She put her flower in the vase and a piece of paper beside it. Then she returned to her parents. Seeing little Sarah place her flower in the vase for the last time moved everyone in this small church. And at the end of the service, people gathered around Sarah and her parents trying to offer as much love and support as possible. And the doctor said, I could barely bear to watch. Four days later, Sarah died. He says he wasn't expecting it, this doctor, but his pastor asked him to see him after the funeral. We stood at the cemetery near our cars as people walked past us, and in a low voice, the, the pastor said, Dave, I've got something that you ought to see. He pulled out of his pocket that piece of paper that Sarah had left by the vase, and holding it out to me, he said, you better keep this. It may help you in your line of work. And he said as he opened this small folded piece of paper to read, written out in pink crayon, Sarah had said, Dear God, this vase has been the biggest honor of my life. Sarah. You see, the Christian life, it's an opportunity to serve. Under the lordship of Jesus, whatever gifts he has given us for the good of others, even if it's just a dandelion in a vase. Are you with me this morning? So Jesus wants you to be free, wants me to be free from a self-indulgent consumer life. He wants us to be free to a life of service. You have been gifted. How will you use it for good. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Spirit.